Are you sick and tired of Laravel telling you that it cannot resolve a dependency? Are you just fed up with getting reflection exceptions even though what you were doing had nothing to do with reflection at all? Do you just wish you had a hundred slide presentation with code telling you all about the I containers in excruciating detail? Oh boy, do I have a talk for you right now. So, hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch. I hope you're well fed. My name is Kai Zasnowski. I will be talking to you about dependency injection containers, and I actually do have 100 slides to go through, so let's skip the intro bullshit and get to it. So, if we want to talk about the I containers, we first need to talk about dependency injection itself. However, this is not a talk about dependency injection. This is more of a quick refresher, so we're all on the same page. Let's take an example. Let's say you have a class like this. This is a session storage, which is essentially a very thin wrapper around the PHP session uh, that just has a set and a get method that basically just manipulates the PHP session super global. And then you have a user class that has a dependency on the session storage, and then has two more methods, set language and get language, just, just utilizes, utilizes the session storage behind the cover to set the user's preferred language. Now, whether or not this is good design in the first place is a different question. This is just an example to illustrate a point. However, if you're familiar with DI, have read any blog posts, or are you, you're using it, have watched any videos, you will know that this line is the line that I will take offense to more often than not. And it's because the user class is instantiating its own dependency in its constructor, which is problematic. And it's problematic because it introduces very tight coupling between these two classes, which leads to things like it's difficult to test, for example, if you wanted to test the user class without hitting the session. There's no obvious way without some weird reflection magic to pass in a different implementation of a session storage, for example. So what you usually do is instead of instantiating it in the constructor, you extract it to a constructor parameter. And now something else other than the user class is responsible for creating this session storage. And then you assign it to a field. And now you have the freedom in a test, for example, to just pass in a mock. Or you can make a, an interface out of the session storage and uh, be even more flexible like this. So this is what we call constructor injection, where we declare all of our dependencies as constructor parameters. So something else is now responsible for supplying the user class with all its dependencies. There are other ways of doing dependency injection, for example, setter injection. I will be exclusively focusing on constructor injection in this talk, and I think in 99% of the cases, you should too. OK, and here's how you use this example. You create the session storage first, and then you create the user and pass it the session storage. And then you can use the set language and get language method, and everything's great. This looks OK, but this is a very simplistic example. We only have two objects. There's only one level of dependency. One of these objects doesn't even have a dependency. So doing sort of this manual construction of objects in this case might seem OK. However, in real life applications, our dependencies often end up looking a little more like this where we have not only one level of dependencies, but we have multiple. Our dependencies have dependencies. And now, when we want to create, in this case, this shipping service, we not only have to create the shipping service, we have to create the product locator, pricing service, inventory service, tracking service that needs a config provider, and logger that needs an email logger that needs a config provider. So at this point, the sort of manual instantiation of objects becomes less feasible. That's the one problem. And the other problem is, this is a lot of knowledge about a whole bunch of objects that's required to create the shipping service. Whatever part of the application is trying to create a shipping service now knows about all of its dependencies and its transitive dependencies. It knows the entire object graph. So this is kind of difficult. You don't want to copy and paste this line of code every time you want a shipping service. So we need a better way to manage these more complex dependency trees. Luckily, this is where now containers come in to the rescue. With a container, I can replace all this cruft with just this. I can say container get session storage. And then somehow, through some black magic, the container does its thing and gives me back an instance of a shipping service. 
And notice how I don't have to know anything about how the shipping service is constructed. I don't know anything about its dependencies. I simply ask the container, yo, I'm going to need a shipping service. I'll wait here for you to finish. And when you're done, uh, I'll get an instance of a shipping service. So what we're going to look at now is what actually goes on behind this one line. What happens when I call container get? How does a container uh, do it? And we're going to do this by writing our own, because I think this is the best way with, when it comes to anything programming related, is you implement your own. Not necessarily for production usage, don't roll your own crypto kids, but for educational purposes, writing your own implementations of something is, in my opinion, the best way to learn. Because you will learn about all the nasty edge cases, and you will really have to understand what goes into the algorithm. And so this is what we're going to do now. And if you've never done this before, if you've never written a DI container from scratch, you might think this is going to be really complicated because they kind of had this mystique about them, that they are these really complicated things because they're able to resolve these arbitrarily complex dependency trees. So by definition, they kind of have to be complicated, right? And you will be surprised at how little code it actually takes to get one, to, to get a fully functioning DI container. What you need to understand about DI containers is, at their core, when you strip away all the nice to have and all the bells and whistles and all the quality of life features and just trim it down to what's really essential, a container is just like a big old array. It's a glorified array. It's just a big mapping of this class gets instantiated by this factory, and you just have a whole bunch of them, and then that's it, essentially. So if you want to create a container, we need a place to store these bindings. Okay, let's create an empty array, call it bindings, and then we need a way to register one of these factories into the container. So let's add a method called set that takes two parameters, the abstract, which is the thing that we're trying to get back later, the instance, right, or the class of which we want an interface later. And secondly, the factory, and I've added a type in to just make it really explicit. This is just something that when I call it, will give me back an instance of whatever abstract is. And then we simply set it into this bindings uh, array with the abstract being the key. And abstract is more, most likely going to be the fully qualified name of whatever class you're trying to later resolve. So this is just like array uh, operations. And then, of course, we need a way to get an instance from this container. This is what we really want to do, to set this kind of configuration. It's also pretty simple. You get the registered binding for this abstract. Again, this is going to be, more often than not, the fully qualified name of the class. And then since we know it is a callable, we will just call it and pass the instance of the container to the callback. And this, no pun intended, is where the magic is going to happen. We're going to come back to this later. For now, just keep this in mind. And now we're done. This is a fully functioning dependency injection container asterisk. Technically, this is not a container yet. Because technically, in order to be a container, it needs to keep track of the instances it has already instantiated. However, for, these, for this example, where we're just trying to understand how a container works when it's resolving objects, that is a meaningless distinction. So I've left it out on purpose. But I know someone was, was going to mention it on Twitter, so I'm just saying it here. This is not an oversight. I let it out on purpose. But this is all it takes. Now we can create arbitrarily complex dependency graphs, and this will be able to handle them. And let's see how how we use this container. <laughs> I keep, forget <laughs> keep forgetting I have to end. So the way this is supposed to go, and this is it. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. OK, cool. So let's look at the example from before again. Let's take the session storage again. Nothing changed. Let's take the user class. Nothing changed. It still has a dependency on the session storage. And just to make this example a little bit more interesting, we'll add another dependency to the mix. We'll just say, Let's say the session storage depends on a logger as well. We don't really care about the implementation of these objects right now. We just care that there is a dependency. And so the logger is just going to be called by the session storage when it sets something in the session. OK, so we have three classes now that we want to manage with the container. And then we, excuse me, then we have some dummy implementation of the logger. The implementation really doesn't matter. 
And now here's how you use the container. First of all, you get an instance of the container, and now we register our bindings. At the end, we want to get back an instance of a user class, so let's start with that. We'll say container set. First parameter, fully qualified name of the user class. This is what we want to get back. Second parameter is the factory that, when called, will give me something like this. It will give me an instance of a user. However, we already know that this is not going to work because the user has a dependency. The real question is what goes in here? We could just do this. We could just, again, explicitly pass in every single dependency and new it up by hand. But that's kind of pointless. That's what we're trying to get away from. Because now, the factory for the user knows how to create a session storage and a logger, and it gets really weird. And any time a class would have a dependency on a session storage, you'd have to duplicate these two lines of code. So that's not really what we're trying to do. So let's scrap that. What else can we do? Let's look at the implementation of our container again. I mentioned earlier, this is where the magic happens. This is the magic bit. If we didn't have these seven characters, the open bracket, dollar this, closing bracket, we would literally have an array. This would be a shitty array wrapper. Right? This is the only seven characters that sets this class apart from an array. Because what this allows us to do is we can now accept the container as a parameter to our factory. And now, when we need to build the dependencies of the user class, we simply go back to the container. We say, I'm just trying to build a user here. But I also need a session storage. So container, please, if you would be so kind. Now, this is really the core concept. There's a recursive call back to container get. This is the key word. There's recursion here. This recursive call to, con to container get is what enables all this crazy magic. Now, of course, right now the container doesn't know how to create a session storage. So we need to tell it how to. Same exact problem. Here's the session storage class, and here's the factory that, when called, will give me back an instance of that class. And again, we need a logger, but in this factory, we're not concerned with how to create a logger instance. So instead, we just defer back to the container. So another recursive call. And now finally, we just tell it how to create a logger as well. And this one's easy because the logger has no further dependencies, and we can simply return the logger. That's all the configuration we have to do. And here's how you use it. You simply call container get just like we want it. And then we can use user set language and user get language. Now, now you essentially know how a container works, but I'm not convinced that you really understood it. Because there's recursion here at play. And the thing with recursion is always, it reminds me of this image on the internet where it's like how to draw an owl. It's like draw two circles, draw the rest of the fucking owl. This is kind of how I think about recursion the first time you encounter it. It is like step one, do something. Step two, recurse. Right? It's like something is missing here. The very first time, it's always kind of difficult if you try to evaluate it in your head what is actually going on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look step by step at what happens when I call container get. How is this line evaluated? So we'll start out by saying container get. And if you think back to the implementation, it's basically an array lookup. So we look up whatever factory was registered for this class. And then we call it. And when this function body is evaluated, we'll try to create a new user instance. But before we can do this, we need a session storage instance. So here is our first recursive call back to the container. So we go one level in of recursion. But if you notice, it's the exact same problem again, just with a different parameter. We're still saying container get some class. It just happens to be session storage in this case and user in the other context. So same exact recipe that we're following. What's the factory that's, being regist that's been registered? Well, it's this one. OK, same problem. I need to create a session storage instance. But before I can do this, container, I'm going to need you to get me a logger interface. So here's our second recursive call. And now, here's our base case. Recursion always needs a base case, otherwise your computer is going to explode. Right? Otherwise, you get infinite recursion. In our case, a base case is when we have a class that has no further dependencies, because then 
we don't have any need of going back to the container to resolve anything more. We can simply call new logger. So this is the base case, which means the innermost container get call can now simply return the logger instance. And that gets plucked up in here, which is great, because now this function can return. There's nothing else to do. And now that gets plucked in here. And now the user can finally be constructed. And we end up with a user and a session storage and a logger. And now you know how a DI container works. And every single DI container does this in some form or another. Their implementations might differ slightly, but at their core, this is what they do. It's this recursive building of dependencies by just going back to the container. And all it took is this, which is pretty incredible if you ask me. This shows you the power of recursion. Right? We have seven characters removed from an array, and it's able to do crazy stuff. Now, obviously, if you look at this container, this is not as nice to use as, for example, the container you might be used to from Laravel or Symfony or PHPDI or, I don't know, one of the seven million other containers that exist. They have a lot more quality of life features. And, but at their core, this is what they do. And now with the remaining time, we're going to look at a, a bit more of an advanced feature that some of the more fully fledged containers tend to have, uh, and that's the feature of auto wiring. And auto wiring is funny because that's always one of the prime targets for people calling it magic, which is, to me, the funniest thing. The word magic is so fascinating to me because developers are just like the most superstitious people in the world. And it's funny to think about what do they even mean when they say magic? And it's usually kind of it's a thing where it's more convention over configuration based, yes. But to me, when someone calls something else magic, it always says ignorance. I don't know how this thing works. You will never call something magic if you know how it works. That, to me, always implies I don't know how this thing works, and I don't like it. So kind of the sub-theme of this talk is to maybe remove some of the mystique from auto-wiring and uh, remove the, the, the magic component from it. So what is auto-wiring? Auto-wiring is the ability of the container to create an instance of a class without having an explicit binding or an explicit factory registered. In other words, we don't have to ex register an explicit factory for a class in order for the container to be able to give me back an instance of it. So we can take this, delete all the configuration crap, and just use the container. Just create the container and use it. No configuration necessary. And the way this works, at least one implementation, it's the one that Laravel uses is reflection-based auto-wiring, and this is the basic recipe. We're going to go through them step by step. First, you build a reflection class of whatever class you're trying to instantiate. Second, and here's the recursive step, you build its dependencies. How do you build its dependencies? You get its constructor, you look at the param parameters of the constructor, and then you look at the type hints of those parameters. And then for each of those type hints, here's the recursive step. You build that class. And you go back to the top. And you do that until you've built everything. And then you finally create a new instance from this reflection class with these parameters. So let's go through this one by one. We're going to change our container get method. Step one, create a reflection class. And don't worry if you're not too familiar with reflection. It's like turtles all the way down. You get back reflection classes and methods and reflection parameters. It's reflection everywhere. But it doesn't really matter. Um, you will see just how you can use it. And it's kind of like an incidental detail. But you create a reflection class. And now the variable reflection contains an instance of a reflection class. Step two, build its dependencies. Now, just to stick a bit more to the wording in the recipe, we're just going to add a private function here called build dependencies, and we're going to pass it the reflection class. And now let's take a look at how that function is implemented. Step one, or 2.1, is you get the constructor. OK, that's easy enough. You can, on a reflection class, call the method getConstructor, which gives you an instance of reflection method, I believe. However, what if there is no constructor? That's pretty good in our case, because we already said we're only looking at constructor injection. So that's the only injection point. That means if there is no constructor, there are no dependencies. We're done. We can just return an empty array and say, here are the dependencies of this class. It's basically the zero value is the empty array. Then we're done. Cool. What if we have a uh, constructor? OK, 
Then we'll take a look at the parameters of the constructor. And you can do that by saying get parameters on this constructor variable, which gives you back an array of reflection parameter, I think. And then for each of those parameters, we're trying to turn it into an instance of a class that it represents, that is being type hinted. Okay, so we we have this list of parameters, and we want to transform each of those object, uh, each of those entries in this list into something else. So we're just going to use an array map. So what are we going to do with each of those parameters? We're going to look at the types. Specifically, that means the type hint. So we can say param get type. However, what if there is no type hint? If there is no type hint, we have to bail. There's nothing we can do at this point, and this is why reflection-based auto wiring needs type hints, because that's kind of the meta information that the auto wiring will use to infer which types you, you actually need. So if there are no types hint, type hints, there's nothing we can do. We basically just have a variable name. So this is maybe when you get those weird reflection exceptions, now you know why there's reflection involved at all. It's, it's because of this. OK, what if we do have a type? Well, that's pretty good, because now what we have, what get type returns is a string. And a type hint is just the fully qualified name of a class. And now we're trying to build an instance of the fully, quali fully qualified name of a class. Sound familiar? Here's the recursive step. We just say, OK, container, please build this thing. And this is where the recursion happens. And then we do that for every constructor parameter. And then we're finally left with all the dependencies of this class. Now, I'm going to say again, just for brevity's sake, and so it fits better on a slide, I've left out some obvious error handling. Now, this, for example, would fail with scalar type hints. Right? If I have a string or an int type hinted, at some point it would say, it would try and do like new lowercase string, and it'll break. Uh, so assume that there, there is a bit more just edge case handling and error handling involved uh, than is on the slide right now. But essentially, this is what the algorithm looks like. And then finally, at the very bottom, you call one of the most well, worst named functions in PHP, which is saying something called new instance args. And it's beautiful because I always read it like new instance args. Like instance args is a thing that I'm creating. But the way you have to read it is new instance with these args. So that's, that's pretty great. It pisses me off every time. And you, you pass it the dependencies we've just created. So the new instance arcs is basically the way of creating a, an instance from a reflection class. You're just going back uh, and turn your reflection class into an instance of that class. And then the three lines at the very bottom of this uh, at the very top of this function are basically our initial implementation of get, where we still check, do we have an explicit binding? And if we do, we will always prefer that. So if there is an explicit binding, we will use it. Otherwise, we will try an auto-wire. Now, again, if you look at the Laravel container, this is not quite what you will find. It's a bit more complicated, but it is more complicated because the container can do a lot more things than our container can. In Laravel, you have aliasing, you have tagging, you have contextual bindings, you have extension, and a bunch of other stuff that I've forgotten now. But if you look at look at the implementation, you will see lines that look very much like this. So at, the, at its core, it is still very much doing that. It's just doing a bunch of extra stuff on top of it. And now we can call container get without any configuration, and the auto wiring will take care of instantiating the objects for us. Now, of course, there are a few cases where you still require a explicit binding. For example, if you're type hinting an interface. If you're typing in an interface, that cannot be auto-wired without any sort of information, well, what concrete class should I instantiate? I can instantiate an interface. So in this case, you will still need a, uh, a concrete binding in the container. There's other cases where you, I said in 90% of the cases, you will pass in the fully qualified name as the first parameter. You could pass in any string if you wanted. Right? You could register arbitrary things into the container, um, but then the container would kind of, then you would need the, uh, the factory if you, for example, want to inject a scalar value, like something that cannot be newed up, and you still want to use the container for that, you can just say container, and then as the identifier, you say just foo, and then just have a function that returns something. And when it tries to resolve it, it'll, it'll um, 
get the value from this factory method. Okay, so if you've just woken up from your uh, post-lunch nap, welcome back. This is what you missed. It's recursion. This is the, the underlying concept with what makes containers so powerful with so little code. It's this idea of, I'm only concerned with instantiating a user. And I don't care about how any of its dependencies are instantiated. I'll go back to the container for that. And I hope this has been helpful. And I hope you've learned something. And I hope this has removed this magic and mystique from DI containers and also auto wiring that now you understand how they work. You will also be able to, when you get one of these crazy errors that just blow up and you get an error message that has nothing to do with what you were trying to do, you might now know, oh, OK, because it's doing this behind the covers. And it's using reflection this and that way, and that's why I'm getting a reflection exception. And now that might help you debug the problem. Because before, if you don't know what it is, and you just treat it as magic, and if it blows up, and these things, if they blow up, they have a tendency to really blow up. Like the more sort of convention over configuration, over configuration based they get, the more cryptic the error messages tend to get, because it's just so far abstracted away from what you're doing, and you don't know what it's doing. But if you do, then the error messages all of a sudden make sense to you because you know how reflection fits into the picture. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Mm -hmm.